When you think about handling text inside a scikit-learn, you might naturally start thinking about this estimator called the count vectorizer. This count vectorizer is a tool that's also pretty flexible. There's a couple of useful settings, like you're able to set the number of n-grams that you're going to have a look at, and you're also able to specify an analyzer. This allows you to configure if you want to have tokens that are words, but you can also go for characters instead, which is great for subwords, but also for situations where spelling might be a concern. What's a little bit less well known though is a variation of the count vectorizer that's known as the hash vectorizer. There's a lot of features that both of these two vectorizers share. You can also set the number of n-grams over here, and you can also set the analyzer. But what's great about the hash vectorizer is that you can actually use a trade-off. You can choose to make this featureization technique more lightweight than the count vectorizer at the cost of a bit of performance. The goal of this video is to explain how this hash vectorizer works. And in doing so, I also hope to explain the effect of hashing a little bit further, which will also be useful in upcoming videos. Now, before going in depth in the hashing vectorizer, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what the count vectorizer does internally. It'll help set the stage. Suppose I have a sentence, I am happy, and another one, dog is happy. The whole point of the count vectorizer is to turn texts like this into representations that are good for machine learning. And one way to do that is to just count how often each token appears. So that means that first a tokenizer is going to run in a base setting that is going to recognize that this sentence has three words, and then it's going to basically start collecting a dictionary. There's the word I, there's the word am, there's the word happy. And then we move on to the next sentence. Dog is happy. In this case, the next word would be dog because that's a new word. Then we have the word is, but the word happy already appears. So we don't need to worry about indexing that. If we then think about representing this text, we can do it with ones and zeros in this case. Every time a word appears in the document, we see a one and a zero otherwise. Note, by the way, that we could also go a step further. Theoretically, what I could also do is I could set the n-grams. I could do something like, well, I want the one grams and the two grams. That's a setting. And in this case, it would also index sequences of words. So I am would then also become a token, just like am happy. And note that I could also do things with characters here. That's, these are all options that the count vectorizer allows for. But although all those settings are great, the count vectorizer does come with a downside. And that is that the vocabulary can be huge. If I'm going to go over all the texts in a large data set, so to say, then we can expect the vocabulary to be big to the extent that we have lots and lots of columns. And although many of the algorithms inside a scikit-learn can totally deal with these wide sparse arrays, you can wonder if we actually need all of these words. This claim does depend a little bit on the use case, but you could imagine, for example, if we're interested in doing something with sentiment analysis, that is to say, we have some class with positive remarks and we have some class with, let's say, negative remarks and maybe also a neutral class, well then, you can kind of imagine that there are just a couple of words that will really matter. Words like amazing will probably fit the positive class very well, and words like horrible will probably fit the negative class very well. Now you can definitely imagine many words like I, am, and is that really won't matter much to this sentiment task. So maybe we don't need to store all of these words, and that's where a hashing trick might be useful. So now let's review what the hashing vectorizer would do instead. In the case of a hashing vectorizer, you would upfront tell the estimator how wide the sparse array is going to be. So let's say we're going to go for size 10. And again, I am happy. Dog is happy. Those are the two sentences going in. Then I've got an array here of width 10. And in this case, the way that I'm going to associate a token with a slot in this matrix is by using a hashing function. A hashing function is a function that takes some sort of an input, in this case, the token i, and then it will output a random but consistent big number. Maybe something like this. Now, when I say random here, I do mean that this number that comes out, 
it's not impossible to guess up front what the hash is going to be, but we are dealing with a function over here that is consistent. That is to say, if I were to give this function the same input, the same output would appear. If I were to take a different word, am, the hash would be totally different. So at this point, you might wonder, well, how does that relate to the matrix that we see over here? Well, it all comes down to this number that we've got over here. What we're going to do is we're going to take the mod operation and we're going to use the width to basically figure out what the remainder is. In the case over here, it is 6, and in the case here, it is 8. If you're unfamiliar, this mod operator basically says let's divide by 10, and then whatever the remainder is, that is the number that I'm going to emit. If I divide by 10 over here, 6 will remain, and if I divide by 10 over here, 8 will remain. That's where these numbers come from. Let's now also assume that I'm going to be hashing the word happy, and that this gets associated with slot number 1, let's say. Then the representation for the first sentence would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Again, the one values that we see over here are there simply because this final value, after we've done the hashing and the modding, that's what determines where the ones go. What's cool about this hashing vectorizer is that we can basically just tell the width up front. There's no need to see the entire vocabulary. As long as we have this number up front, we know how to generate features for it. One really cool benefit of this is that it also means that we can generate these features in an online fashion. And that is because this operation is stateless. Before, we had to know the entire vocabulary in order to know which word goes where in the big array. But because we're using a hashing function and because we know the size up front, we don't need to know anything about the entire data set. We can really just look at each row individually in order to make features for them. However, this hashing vectorizer does come with a downside. And that is the fact that you can get these things known as a collision. Let's, for example, say that I'm taking the hash of dog and then the hash of is as well. And let's now presume that after we do all this hashing, dog is over at slot number three, but is, after all the hashing, also overlaps with slot number one. That would mean that both happy and is fall into the same slot. And when you have a constrained space, this will always happen because you're always going to have to pigeonhole words in a constrained number of indices. So in that case, it might look a little bit more like this. In short, this is what the hashing vectorizer does. And what I hope that you can appreciate at this point is that this allows us to do online and stateless feature generation, and that we have a feature space that is indeed constrained. There is a trade-off though, because you can also imagine that if we have a very small feature space that the features might be lightweight, but any downstream tasks that would follow might suffer, simply because these features might overlap. So there's definitely a bit of a trade-off here, but that trade-off can be mitigated by looking at this number as a hyperparameter. So with this little bit of theory out of the way, maybe the next best thing that I can do is just to do a little bit of a benchmark that shows the effect of this hyperparameter, because that might really help get you an intuition on how this vectorizer uh, does its work. So to demonstrate this hashing vectorizer a bit more, I figured I might need a benchmark data set. And I've settled on the 20 news group data set that you can get from scikit-learn. In this data set, there are about 20 categories of news items that you can classify. But the main point is not to run a perfect benchmark on this data set. The point is more to show how the vectorizer works by constraining the features a bit. If you have a look at the code over here, you can see that I've got a pipeline with the hashing vectorizer in it. I am telling it to just use the word analyzer, and I'm not doing anything fancy with n-grams over here. Every single word will just occupy a slot in the big feature matrix. But the size of the number of features, that is something that I am going to be looping over down here. There's one setting where I'm really constraining the features, and I'm going to give it a bit more features over here. But at this point, you could wonder what the effect might be. It does feel very likely that if we have a larger feature space, that the logistic regression that follows might be able to distinguish more patterns from it. So it shouldn't be too surprising to see this setting to have the best performance. But you can also wonder if there's maybe some sort of a sweet spot. Do we really need 10,000 features, or can we make do of less? And that 
is something that the chart below shows. This chart shows the cross-validated results, and we can see that the test score definitely goes up quite quickly when we give it more and more features. You could also definitely say it's doing quite poorly uh, when we only give it a few hundred features or so. Once we get up to the larger thousands though, we do see the effect being somewhat marginal. A thousand features over here does way more than a thousand features extra over here. So on its own, that's already pretty interesting. There does seem to be a bit of a trade-off. If we are very constrained on memory, there does seem to be a bit of a balance over here. We can make do with way less features, and hashing might actually give us a somewhat pragmatic way to still be able to capture some patterns. However, it is not a free lunch. If I were to scroll down, it seems that the best performing score in this situation over here gets us about 78% accuracy. If I were to compare that with the count factorizer though, then there is a big gap. To so use the base count factorizer, then the mean test score is about 10% higher than what I see over here. So that's definitely a substantial difference. However, we should also contrast that to the vocabulary size. If I use a count factorizer, then it uses 130,000 features in order to have a feature matrix that the logistic regression can go ahead and use. And if you consider that the hashing factorizer uses about one tenth of that over here, then this result might not seem so bad. It just really depends on your perspective. In general, the count factorizer inside a scikit-learn could be seen as your good first step. If it works in a count factorizer, definitely go ahead and use it. That's great. But there are also moments when the hashing factorizer could make just a little bit more sense. And in particular, if you're interested in learning in an online fashion, then having a featureizer that is stateless, that is going to be very useful indeed. And in particular, if you have a small budget, as far as memory goes, then this might be something worth checking out. Although for a lot of modern machines, you're probably going to be just fine using the count factorizer. It also deserves mentioning that of course, there are lots of different featureization techniques from the realm of NLP that we can also go ahead and use. Things like word embeddings, or maybe transformer models. Those can definitely also be useful. The main point that I do hope to get across in this video though, is that there is something about hashing that can generate features on our behalf that turn out to be useful and that turn out to have interesting properties. And as we'll see in the next video, we can actually build on this hashing technique to get a featureizer that is going to be very useful in the realm of dirty categories as well.